Hey, good evening. Another edition of Montpelier Civic Forum. And no, this is not February. We don't have town meeting day coming. But I felt it was appropriate that we do a series of shows now on the reopening of Montpelier. And they're really good shows, all of them are. Uh, we have Ann Watson talking from the mayor's slot on how she views what's come down since town meeting day and what's come down since I talked to her in February. Uh, Bill Fraser, same way. Uh, talking about the abysmal state of the city budget and the regulations that council has passed to keep us all safe. I have um, Carolyn Brennan from the Kellogg Hubbard Library talking about the reopening of the Kellogg Hubbard Library and talking about what's been going on. Uh, I have uh, Dan Groberg from Montpelier Live talking about downtown businesses and what has and hasn't been going on downtown with downtown businesses. I have John Odom coming in from the city clerk's office talking about our, our elections in August and November. That's a good show. I have uh, Libby Bonesteel and um, Jim Murphy from the schools, from the Montpelier Roxbury schools, talking about the spring, talking about the graduation that was and wasn't, and most importantly, talking about what their thinking is for the fall. But this one's an honor, and this one is, is special to me. I've got both police chiefs today. I've got uh, Tony Fakos with one day left, and I've got Brian Pete, who's been on the job and will be flying solo after that one day. And uh, I am just thrilled to have the Chiefs. Tony, we finally got rid of you. Yep, 35 years. It took a while, but I'm, got, I'm, I'm heading out. Heading out to what? Uh, that's up in the air right now, but I'm going to stay in Montpelier for a while. You were born in Montpelier. I was. What part of town? Uh, I was born right in the Heaton Hospital, right, uh, which is now Heaton Woods. And I uh, went up, grew up uh, with my, and my older sisters. We went through the Montpelier Public School System. And, and you were at Montpelier High School when they had football and not ultimate frisbee. That is correct. And ice hockey and alpine skiing. The, the complete slate. Yes. Now, when did you go into policing? Uh, How did that path come to a boy from Montpelier High School? Sure. Uh, it happened uh, second semester of my freshman year in college, and I um, applied for a, a job as an auxiliary state trooper with the Vermont State Police, which is basically a uh, marine patrol, the boats in the summertime. And, and uh, I was fortunate, and I got that job in, uh, the, in the spring of 1985. So you went from boats to bikes? Uh, yeah, a few years later, anyway, yes. What was the transition from, uh, onto the Montpelier Police Department? So, and you were the cop on the bike. I, I was one of many. Um, so in, in the uh, so, I was uh, already an auxiliary trooper, uh, and the um, that summer between my freshman and sophomore year, and in August of 1985, later that same year, uh, Chief Hoyt hired me as a part-time patrol officer, and <clears throat> so then uh, in 1987, I uh, was decided I really wanted to go into law enforcement full time, and and. Uh, was hired full time as a Montpelier police officer in 1987. So the, well, the bikes didn't come around. The bike patrol, uh, we didn't start that until 1993. What was the theory behind the bike patrol? Uh, it's really uh, it, so many things uh, uh, that are positive about a bike patrol. Number one, they're, you're out in the public, you're accessible. It's just like foot patrol, except you have a little more mobility. And, um, so where foot patrol to me, um, one of the downsides, if, if, if you want to create problems, uh, let's say you want to break into cars or something, well, if you look at, you know, you see, okay, the officer's at State Main right now, so I can go do something, uh, you know, another part of town. So the mobility that you have on a bike, bicycle is, is, is one of the strongest assets of being on a bicycle patrol unit. So you have speed, you have stealth, but you have that approachability, and the best part is kids, kids and adults because they can relate. Because when you're in the neighborhoods, uh, you know, a child will say, wow, he's on a bicycle, I'm on a bicycle. And it was just a win-win uh, way of policing, one part of patrolling. So it was an early version of community-based policing? It was a, uh, an aspect of it, uh, a tool for community-based policing. How many people were on the staff? You were in the, the Montpelier of 8,500, not 7,500. Yeah, we, we fluctuated, I think, you know, I, I don't even remember, so, uh, but we've, we've bounced around between 16 officers to as high as 19 officers, 
I think we may have been around 87, near the 18 plus mark, I think, I'm not sure. So you're roughly the same size police department that we are? Correct. Chief Pete, I am the official <laughs> greeter. On town meeting day, I gathered 25 signatures in order to be the official greeter. Welcome to Montpelier. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege, uh, privilege to be here. How did police chief, where was he born and how did he get into policing? Um, well, I was... Speaking of you in the third person. <laughs> I was born in uh, Chicago on the south side. Um, and uh, uh, policing is, it, it kind of turned into a family business, if you will. My, both of my parents joined the Chicago Police Department later on in their lives and in their careers. And um, so as I was going through, you know, graduating through grammar school and then and on to high school is when my parents started coming into the law enforcement fold. Um, and then seeing what they were doing was, was extremely interesting. So I ended up getting uh, graduating from college and getting a commission in the Air Force and uh, started off in aircraft maintenance. And um, But that pull towards law enforcement was 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 really attractive and strong for me. So I ended up going into uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And then after doing um, five years, roughly five years there, that's when I came back, uh, left the Air Force and came back to Chicago and then joined the Chicago Police Department. Was your brother on the force at that time? Uh, no, not at the time. I was the third and then my brother uh, came a little, a few years after. What, <laughs> Chicago seems like such a different world than Montpelier. First of all, on the <laughs> south side of Chicago, is that uh, White Sox or Cubs territory? White Sox territory. My wife is a Cubs fan, so uh, that I had to, to eat that one when we first met. This is a very beautiful, smart, intelligent woman, and I want to get to know her. So I had to make certain sacrifices, and since she was a Cub fan, um, I had to go to a Cub game. That was the first and uh, hopefully the last time I'll ever go to a Chicago Cubs game. And I say that in jest. The Cubs are a great team, but I'm a White Sox person. What is the south side of Chicago? I mean, how many people live there? Uh, what? Oh, lots. Uh, south side is, uh, and it's, you know, right now, because of what's going on in, in life and everything that, that's happening within Chicago, um, when you say south side, it's always synonymous with, with violence. Uh, but there are, speaking very honestly and frankly, the entire city is gentrified. So you have uh, different color, uh, colors, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, even religions uh, that, are, that are concentrated in certain areas, um, and, and as well as socioeconomic status. But within the South Side, there are pockets everywhere within it. So um, you could literally cross one side of the tracks and everything's great. <laughs> you cross back over to the other side of the tracks, uh, things may not be so great. Uh, so um, it, it's just, there's a lot going on. Were you assigned to your own neighborhood as Tony uh, was working his own neighborhood? <laughs> no, in, uh, in, chi in Chicago, um, it's, everything's based on seniority. So um, when I got out of the academy, didn't matter how old I was, didn't matter what experiences I had, and it's low, pers low, low person who just got in, newest person, you're going to nights and you're going into the areas that we need manning at. So I ended up going to the west side now, what um, is the west Chicago. side of Chicago like? It's another one of those places when you Google it, and they say the, the, here are where a lot of the concentrated uh, acts of violence happen, unfortunately. So they tend to be at the uh, south and the west sides, and I was in the 11th district in one of the more um, uh, busiest districts within the city limits. Now, the 11th district, how many police were assigned to the, more than 18 probably? Uh, yeah, we roughly would, if we were lucky, we'd do it at demanding issues, we would have 18, oh, not even that many, on, on one particular shift. So there, there are literally hundreds. Chicago is a department of, uh, on paper, depends on who you talk to, but 13 to 13-5 uh, uh, sworn officers for the department. 13,500? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you're sitting in a precinct, I would imagine, that's bigger than our police department. Yes, but, and I'll also say to that is, uh, I think there are pros and cons with everything, but I think smaller uh, agencies have a more, I think have more challenges, uh, have, have a different set of challenges that larger uh, departments do not have. And to me, they're, because they're so personable, they're a lot more difficult, in my humble opinion. How so? Well, you can get lost in the crowd. 
in Chicago. You can get lost. You can just be just another officer. You can kind of just ride things the way they are. You come to a smaller community, you can't get lost. There are expectations. There are, uh, take, take Montpelier, for example. There's a culture here in law enforcement, and there are expectations. And when these discussions happen amongst supervisors, amongst leaders, um, you, you have to adapt to that culture. You have to understand what those expectations are and you have to, to, to act on them uh, uh, pro progressively and, um, and, uh, and assertively. So you can come down with a policy in the city of Chicago and somebody can say, well, well this doesn't apply to me because I don't do this all the time. Um, but you cannot, you cannot skate past that here. Tony, what was the culture under Police Chief Hoyt? And how did it, how did it evolve to the culture under Tony Fakers? Sure. Um, I I gotta say, uh, you know, Chief Hoyt, Doug was chief for 27 years. Um, so he's the one who hired me. And what uh, was so, uh, you know, to me, anyways, I, as I view his legacy, is that he was the one that really started the modernization of the Montpelier Police Department using technology, um, you know, better accountability tools. So we saw that real shift. And especially when we, when we, uh, you know, moved into the new the new police station, the current station right now. That was what uh, year would that have been? Uh, Two thousand, and uh, so uh, you know, we were able to get, like for example, a technology grant um, with the help of Senator Leahy. Um, but but what Doug really did is he you know he you know one of the most and even today it's so valuable is making sure you hire and bring in the right people. And and uh, so when I took over in two thousand seven, you know when uh, you know when 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 Doug retired. Uh, you know, I had a great crew. I had, you know, we were well established, and um, so it was. I just added my own set of priorities to was already a very solid. What were foundation. your set of priorities that you added? Uh, the the biggest one was training. Um, you know, I made clear that I was, you know, that we would be spending a lot more. We the city would be spending a lot more money on training. Uh, some what elements? What would constitute training? All the way around. Uh, so. Um, you know, high, really focusing on areas of high risk, low frequency that have the greatest liability. For example, use of force, um, and, and you know, it's just you know, vehicle operation. And, you know, we don't do a lot of pursuits, thankfully, uh, anymore. It was a very different time in the 1980s when I came on, um, and it, these were all lessons that I had learned. At what some, what would pursuit be? What what would you say? Chasing people down down memorial? Like a, well, I mean, if we're chasing a vehicle for violations. You know, um, they happened with you know far too much frequency back in you know when I first came on the job. So, um, but there's a variety of things that have changed in policing and and, and the expectations. Uh, mental health. Um, I was uh, at the time one of two negotiators as a patrol officer. Uh, Captain, you know, Captain Neil Martell was the other uh, FBI trained negotiator. We now have three trained negotiators, but certainly mental health crisis response is is, is an, was definitely an area where we also wanted to, to, you know, to invest into that level of training. And also, uh, I did some, some schools that were uh, you know, just advanced uh, crime scene processing and, and keeping up with technology. And, and something that, that, Doug, that Doug had had done with us, but also investing into supervisory training. Many departments, even around here in Washington County, do not send, as soon as you're promoted, send an officer away to a specialized training. Uh, you know, back in my day, as soon as I made sergeant, it was, uh, three weeks at the Institute for um, Law Enforcement Management at Babson, at Babson College in, in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Uh, now uh, we have an arrangement through the New England Chiefs of Police where all of our supervisors, including our corporals, uh, upon promotion, they spent uh, a couple weeks down at Roger Williams where it's a, a much, I think, a, a, a much more robust program. It's one, you know, it's only two weeks versus the three weeks, but I think they're getting a lot more subject matter expertise in that. Is that unique to Montpelier, or is Burlington doing something similar? Oh, no, Burlington, Burlington, Vermont State Police, um, you know, have, they have, uh, you know, the, the state police have, throughout the New England states, my understanding is they have an, an NCO, non-commissioned officer training um, that they go through. And there's also, um, several years ago, a program that um, several of us attended called the LPO, which is Leadership in Police Organizations. It's based on the West Point model of leadership. Uh, uh, so again, I mean, just because you're promoted, if, you don't, if you're not giving these people the skills to succeed, um, to help understand not only you know, the fundamentals of problem solving, but also how to best motivate and take care of you know, the people under your responsibility. Brian, 
You listen to what he said. Does does it resonate? Uh, was it something that was that was going on where you've been a policeman, or was it something that you wished had gone on? I think it was something that I wish had gone on. The um, again, the uh, they're, they're different dynamics uh, and and play in a lot of different areas. But I think it's, I think I need to. I've said it several times before, but Montpelier has been on the cutting edge of policing concepts, 21st century policing concepts. As you know, 21st century policing is, is, uh, is pretty much an introduction from uh, former President Barack Obama. So he brought in a lot of experts who came in, of which my predecessor was one. Now, and weren't they, you both in the same room at one point in the training? Uh, no, no, we we missed each other. He was oh, he was yeah. he was with a with a with a higher panel of folks, and I was <laughs> talking to a to a, another panel of folks about a grant, a CIT grant. He he was talking about things that he had they had implemented, they had come up with and adapted. Best to practices. The important thing is we were both there at a conference about sixteen thousand uh, police chiefs and commanders were talking about law enforcement mental 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 health crisis response though in, in yes. two different lanes. So basically, you're moving on parallel paths, in a sense, um, in terms of 21st century policing. Now, for those of us who don't know what 21st century policing is, which of you wants to talk about the panel that came up with that and its relationship to community policing? Take it away with one of, one of the two sure. of you. Um, <laughs> So the uh, the task force report came out in 2015, and the uh, just to kind of set the historic context, it was after Ferguson, um, and also Baltimore with you know with what happened with Freddie Gray and a lot of others. So um, not that different, um, but certainly not as intense of what we're seeing uh, you know play out right now in America. But something had to change. What's you know, there was a definite disconnect between the community, uh, the police, and and how do we do it better? And so, um, the pre you know, so President Obama put together a task force. It was uh, I draw a blank. I know, uh, uh, you know, at the time, uh, Charles Ramsey, who is the he's now retired commissioner of the Philadelphia Police Department, the former chief of the D.C. Police Department, uh, was w co chaired. And, and I and I, I draw a blank on the other person. Uh, but you had the you know the best and the brightest of, of law enforcement, academia, and key stakeholders to say, hey, let's uh, let's what's going wrong and how do we make it better. So they came up with six very uh, distinct pillars, if you will. That would hold in small towns like ours, as well as in major cities. Exactly. Uni huge yeah, cities universe, where we're not having people yeah. murdered on the street, unfortunately. Yeah. And, but it certainly led to some, I mean, I was fortunate I had a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, with Commissioner Ramsey at an FBI conference up in Quebec City in 2018. And we were talking about, for example, some of the uh, unique, I, I can't remember which specifically we were talking about, but some of the unique challenges that I've had in Montpelier you know, policing. Um, what would those be? What would a couple of those I, be? I can't, I can't remember now. Um, well, one of the areas is, is certainly has to do with the technology you know, piece, something where we, you know, smaller communities um, struggle for, in terms of the cost investment. Um, and what we're and uh, and also the time, the resources. For example, if you're you know running Twitter, you know you know who's going to staff that. You know, and and as you get down to a smaller agency, what happens when you know you don't want to put too much on one or two people because if they're on vacation or something happens, suddenly you know the feed of information suddenly changes. Um, but I, I can't remember which we were talking about. But um, I was also very fortunate. I was at the White House in 2016 with then Police Chief Trevor Whipple from South Burlington and UVM Police Chief Leanne Toomey. So the three of us were down there uh, uh, on an invite to what's called these policy uh, briefings uh, with several of the colleagues. So we had about 90 police chiefs and sheriffs uh, down there and um, just talking about the implementation of, of, of 21st century policing What are the strategies. six pillars? The six one. If you can remember that. Yeah, yeah, sure, no. Uh, the first one is really, and it's the, the cornerstone, is building trust and legitimacy. Uh, you know, it has to do with um, what is legitimacy in terms legitimacy of legitimacy? Is is um, I mean, you're the police? Sure, we're, we're the police, and, if, and yeah, that we have a natural authority, and, and uh, yeah. but also what's procedurally, does the public feel that not only is the system, but also how we are policing, is it fair? You know, is it or um, like right now, this is this is the heart of many uh, of a lot of dialogue, both in state houses and in Congress. Does even. the public yeah. speak with one voice? I mean, in Montpelier, well, all opinions matter. Yes. Well, absolutely. And uh, so, but how do we, so that's, you know, it's things, for example, uh, coffee with a cop. How do we, you know, have, have real dialogue that's not in an adversarial context? 
Yeah. So um, the second. We, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, if, but if I can, if I can, I, I, I pose a question to you and to all your viewers and everyone who's going to see this, uh, in asking about what police legitimacy is. If you're driving down the street and those blue lights come up behind you, oh God, what makes them? Why do you stop the car? You know, I know what the authority? The what gives them the authority? Of the time. <laughs> well, what gives them the authority to pull you over? What 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 causes you or what 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 causes you to stop? Again, it's a joke, but in this town, this is a town of seventy five hundred people, and a lot of us do know everyone who's in that car, you know. Uh, and if I didn't stop, my wife would kill me. Well, see, true, and that too. But you know what else? The other thing is, if you don't have trust, and the only person who's stopping you or who's keeping you from stopping the car is yourself. And if you don't believe in legitimacy or or the authority, Authority, if you will, or you don't observe that with the police officer behind you, you're just going to keep going. So to avoid those types of things, we want to make sure that we earn the trust of the people so that they know us. So when they're pulling us over, or so if we unfortunately have to pull someone over for something like that, they understand that the person who is working is a professional, values their dignity, and honors and respects them. That's what legitimacy is, I think. Have we had a problem with that in the past, Tony? Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it's in pockets. It's, it could be in, in various groups. Um, sometimes even when it's outside external influence, uh, you know, outside of Montpelier, um, you know, they, they can be problematic. So, but, uh, so, so wait, did you want me to finish the, the other pillars? Yeah, or? I was just about oh, okay. to say, yeah, yeah. what are the other sure. five pillars? Um, I'm going to take you guys apart on each pillar. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there's, there's a lot to it, but I... I Personally, I think that the first pillar is the most critical because that everything else, you know, builds on that. So the next one is is you know um, is is good policy and oversight. Um, you know, are, do you, are you providing clear direction to the police officers, and are you holding them accountable to the, whatever standard that is set? So that's really important as well. So you have that consistency, um, you know, and that you can talk to the public about if you know this happens or whatever. This is how this is the policy. This is how the officers are trained. Uh, and that policy, train to that policy. The third pillar is... Well, let me stay oh. on that pillar. Uh, in Bill Fraser's show, he spoke about, we were talking in the context of a civilian uh, police review board, and Bill was saying, my civilian police review board is my city council, and people in Montpelier are not reluctant to give their opinions, and, uh, and to give them loudly, and, and to give them frequently, and this is a council that takes those opinions into account. Do you feel the council gives you a clear direction? Well, the, um, yes and no. I mean, the, our city council, they're, they're, this is, this is, is I'm going to qualify. It's your final I'm gonna day. Quali <laughs> I'm going to qualify this though. Uh, up until recently, it, it's, uh, when we talk, you know, when the city council is, you know, focusing on strategic planning, for example, and goal setting. And, 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 this, it, and I've had the, I've shared this with the fire chief as well. It's like, boy, you know, public safety is kind of like way down here to, um, you know, are we going to get greener vehicles, um, you know, the net zero and affordable housing and all these other things. And then, but then, so, so in one regard, we feel like they don't care about us, but the reality of it is too, um, if it's working, if you're not worried about your safety, uh, that's where any community wants to be. Um, and then there's a lot to be, I think, you know, to be proud of in that. And then, um, so, so to the question of does the city council give me a rough direction, um, you know, they will certainly are very good. If they've got a question, you know, why did this happen this way or, you know, what's needed and, you know, and again, it's uh, through the budget process, if it's financial, uh, I make clear what we feel are our priorities for the department. We want to make sure, obviously, that they're in concert with the strategic goals of the city council. Um, Whereas we're suddenly seeing a shift now is the current, what's happening not only in Montpelier but across the country, um, is now they're paying attention just to making sure, you know, wow, um, do we have policies? You know, is that kind of a, a prohibited hold, um, you know, not, you know, deadly force or something? So now we're having different conversations, but um, it's always, again, from the voice of the representing the, the community, um, you know, as long as they're clear about what we're doing, but now there's a new, a new focus, not because of something that's happened in, in the city of Montpelier specifically, but as it is, it's part of a national conversation. Well, you're at most, if not all, city council meetings. Uh, not, not most. 
So only when there's an item there's or something, something that, that, that's related to the right. police department. And, and if I could tag sure. on to, to what Tony had mentioned, uh, there is a, in, in the the most recent city council meeting, uh, there was an individual who, who had expressed a little bit of frustration and, and wanting to know what the council's thoughts on um, defunding, reducing uh, 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 the budget for the police department, abolishing the police department in its entirety. And uh, it, it's a difficult spot for them to be in. And I want to put my hats off to them because the fact that they didn't come right out and, and, and give an opinion one way or the other, to me says that they're taking their responsibilities extremely serious by looking at listening, absorbing, doing what they're supposed to do as elected officials and hearing from the constituency and then holding the department accountable and asking the department questions to see where it's gonna go or just before they make their decision. So to me, it's an informed decision and um, it's easy to get weighed into that type of politics, but I think doing it recklessly is destructive and they have not done that. So I'm extremely, um, it, it's a hard job. It's not an easy job that they have. Well, I think Tony will speak to this, that in recent years, probably a decade, uh, the city has turned more towards data-driven management in all different elements beside, beyond policing. Tony, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, the first uh, time that I was involved with any significant project, we had the Matrix Group. They, were, uh, they came in um, and, and did a full assessment on each department um, just to look for you know, efficiencies, what's working well, what's not working well. What they and that's based on, um, and they had subject matter expertise in every in each area, such as public works or policing. Uh, so one of the things we looked at uh, there, um, you know, we had an old records management system that was very secure and robust in what it did, but it didn't play well with others. So we had so we couldn't export you know any uh, data. So that was so, so one thing we no longer have that system, but that was certainly a challenge. Other things we learned from that, um, from the efficiency standpoint, but we were too flat of an organization. What does that mean? Uh, in other words, we didn't have enough command and control uh, staff, and so the recommendation was that we clearly uh, designate when, when funding or opportunity presents, a, uh, essentially a cap, you know, a, a number two position. And historically, we used to have a, a police captain in Montpelier. So we brought back the rank of captain, and, and uh, so Captain Neil Martell is now in that position. So if in the absence of, of the chief, for example, uh, you know, the, the captain is fully trained and, and able to run the department, uh, as well as take on other specialized projects. So, um, you know, so that was one area. But also, too, um, with, with data, for example, we've, we've had put together temporary tasks or, or small uh, task forces um, to deal with certain problems. Uh, one we did after a shooting in 2011 that spawned a small unofficial task force, if you will, but under then U.S. Attorney. That was the one at the high school? No. No, which one, which one was 2011? 2011 had a, was, a, was a, a shooting involving uh, drug traffickers. Oh, right, okay, um, right. And, uh, See, so, there's so few shootings in this town that you can Yeah, we're about to say that, but, um, you know, so anyway, so what we did was, it was a really uh, you know, a unique ac you know, effort on behalf of the ATF, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, our, one of our federal partners on, and they were really our go-to agency on violent crime at the time, to, and also worked closely with uh, Chief Bombardier in Barry City and the Vermont State Police, and in particular the Drug Task Force of the Vermont State Police. Uh, and then we brought in also um, prosecutors uh, from the Attorney General's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we, we started looking at, um, you know, the, a small problem here. So the data piece of it, as we, over the course of the next year, there were, uh, I think, I want to say at least 14 in federal indictments. Uh, you know, the, there was a crew involved with the, um, our shooting here. They were convicted um, of, of, you know, conspiring to distribute one or two kilos of crack cocaine in the Barry Montpelier area, plus the shooting and some weapons charges. Um, but what we did was we really um, carefully looked at the drug problem and, and really a targeted approach. In other words, uh, and we've had lasting effects. So we saw, you know, leading up to that, we saw significant late, you know, years following. Eventually, it helped us um, with reducing burglaries and property crime. Um, you know, because one of the things we do know that if you just arrest, you know, drug traffickers coming up, you know, 89, 91, uh, 91, 91 in particular, all day long, you know, you're not going to, you know, effect change in a community. But when you have a really, you know, you take both a tactical and strategic approach, and you're using, you know, um, data 
in terms of you know making sure that and you have you it, it ended up with lasting positive effects in terms of um, controlling crime. Then later it helped set the you know helped spring wars on, on other areas such as uh, we'll get into probably later, but Project Safe Catch and and things. For example, if we can, if you have an addict that is 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 either committing um, you know violent felonies such as armed robbery or dealing very commonly they're going to start dealing narcotics to support their habit uh, burglary and property crime well until you change their addiction if you give them help and support with their addiction you know that that, that problem is going to keep going so that's a different kind of non-traditional way of look, looking at data versus you know what we call cops on dots in other words here's a map you know okay we've had you know in in the luma street area we've mm -hmm. had this many uh car break-ins well my player is so small we all kind of know where those car break-ins are. Um, so, so data tools are different for us in Montpelier uh, in ways we approach data than they certainly would be you know, in various districts in Chicago. But at the same time, um, data could be used to frame the question of whether our police are not seeing through a racial filter. Mm -hmm. uh, we collect data on people who are stopped in Montpelier for traffic citations. Yes. In 2014, there was a, uh, that was a statutory requirement that uh, race, race data be collected on car stops because that's something that's launched, that's the officer initiated, uh, not just a, responding to a call for service. Um, and so that's something that uh, we've been obviously, um, you know, doing what, our obligation uh, to make sure that data is in there. And now the challenge is having, you know, uh, right now we're trying to figure out what is a better platform, a more universal platform that not only helps law enforcement uh, but also it could be forward facing so the public has better access to you know easy to, you know, the big the big thing for commissioner Sherling right now is data that's you know that's easy to understand um, yeah, so um, just i don't want this this moment to slide away um, how many stops do we make approximately a year how many traffic violations if we're full staff we'll we'll probably stop you know upwards of uh, 3000 vehicles maybe 3500 7500 yeah, but that's 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 residential population. Right. You know the roads. That is true. You know who, when you look at our, who's on our roads and, and we have three or two. We have two. Right. So I mean, it, you know, at any given time, estimations of, of people in Montpelier can be well in excess of twenty thousand people by day. Are we seeing any racial disparities in those numbers? We we have not in Montpelier. And if I also may add on to that, while we do have to look at data-driven approaches and intelligence-led policing approaches, we have to make sure we apply the correct lens to filter it out. So you can um, um, look at that type of data and see what type of populations are being stopped by, by uh, law enforcement. But you also have to remember that if we pull over, say if, if you're having a, a if you're looking at a certain time frame and if 10 cars are pulled over and two happen to be uh, people of color or, or five happen to be female or male, then, then there's a skew to that data. So, so automatically you've looked at, you know, if by the, just by being there, four people are pulled over and they happen to be people of color. Then you're going to, then it could, then the numbers could be made to look like that, well, we're disproportionately targeting people of color when in actuality it's just who we're stopping at, what times we're stopping. So you have to make sure that you have a correct filter when you do this, um, that you take everything into context. But um, uh, while not uh, ignoring what that could be, I mean, because if that becomes something that we, we're constantly seeing, th then that deserves a, a, an in-depth conversation with, within the department and within the community itself. Now, Chief Pete, you are going to inherit, if I'm right, Tony, tell me if I'm right, I might be wrong. Uh, the state is going to be requiring body cams? Yes. So you are going to inherit a requirement for body cams. How do you feel about that? Um, every police chief that I've met in my career and all the studies and research that I've done, uh, see, Tony, if I can back up really quick to 21st century police, Tony was there, been there, done that, he got the T-shirt. I was studying people like Tony uh, and moving forward in my, in my career. So, but... Um, Every police chief, I don't think there's one out there. Um, if, there if there is, their time's probably up as far as how this profession's going. But every police chief wants access to body-worn cameras because it helps more. It, it, it de-escalates situations. It improves accountability. Now, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's another tool to add. And uh, so it's just, uh, but the problem with that is, is where you get the money. And so you can well, the buy. The state has said that, you know, <laughs> 
I presume the state will significantly carry this load. Uh, that's to be determined. They will, uh, they're already talking about for the public, Department of Public Safety exactly. for FY22. We're actually more hoping something comes out of Congress um, and some federal funds uh, that, could, that could certainly uh, uh, help springboard us in that direction. Yeah, because we don't envy the state, because we understand the state's predicament too. It's even with the cities, COVID-19. So there's a huge funding lag, or, or, or uh, falls, uh, shortages. So uh, it's, you know, we're coming into a time that, uh, that there's a lot more accountability being demanded, and you do that, and technology was one of the other pillars of policing. Um, but uh, the resources. Do you yeah. have a problem with um, me taping something on my smartphone? As, as I'm watching? That's pretty yeah. commonplace now. Yes. Tony, do you have a problem with... No, we actually have a policy, too, that, that makes clear, makes sure the officers are aware that it is absolutely, uh, you know, constitutionally, uh, you know, appropriate conduct for the public to, to videotape us, to document us in the performance of our duties. Now, now it's probably apocryphal, but I've, I've heard a story that a lot of that taping ends up taping people who are behaving badly. <laughs> that it's not the policeman on that tape who particularly comes off poorly, but the person who is on the other side of that. Is that apocryphal? Does that happen? Uh, well, we, saw, we certainly saw that when we, years, many years ago, when we rolled out, uh, when Chief White rolled out uh, cruiser cams, uh, you know, I gotta say, it was um, some, of the, uh, some of the early complaints that I would, I would, I would handle as a sergeant. Um, and, and this was only for the first maybe couple years. Uh, you know, I'd get the I'd get a it'd be a minor complaint. I would look at the the cruiser video of the car stop, and I was like, "Wow, this person said this to my officer and that." And and then so you call the person back. It's like um, I looked at the video and they're like, "What?" And uh, so you know, I even had one um, that was an in custody one where uh, this person was just really um, berating the officer, and then filed a complaint, and they didn't know that they were being videotaped, and because he was he was he was very intoxicated. We showed him the video, and then he's like, I need, to, I need to contact that officer. I owe him such an apology. So, I mean, that, that was our early, and it's a very tiny piece of what eventually we'll have with body cams. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, and also, we, not only do we see the, sometimes the public may be acting b badly, but also, you know, we're not perfect either, sometimes as well. Um, it, it provides training opportunities for us to, <coughs> to say, you know, back to that whole accountability uh, uh, and oversight, um, you know, to the officers, like, this could have been handled better, or, hey, you know what, you were, you really, um, what you did was, you know, you exposed yourself from a, a dangerous situation, you know, or whatever, if you'd done this. So we always, it's a, it's a good, it's a very, very good, valuable tool, both for the, the police, again, as Brian said, but also, certainly, for the community. By the time Brian reaches the point in his police chiefing that you've reached, will we have a joint communication uh, dispatch center with Barry? Well, we already have uh, some interoperability. That, that's been that's been. We, are, we already have we already have years. some interoperability with Barry um, from a redundancy standpoint, uh, both in the Montpelier continuity of operation plan for dispatch as well as Barry cities. Um, so we're we're getting there, uh, but you know it's um, you know just to have the two cities with you know come together with the you know it's it's complicated because you have got Berlin who's dispatched you know by the Vermont State Police you have Barry Town who's dispatched by the Barry Town I mean by the uh, Lamoille County Sheriff's Department so it's certainly it's a complex uh, conversation but I am a strong um, proponent of regional models where they can effectively happen Chief Pete on the same topic I I'd echo everything that Tony said that um, uh, from from me being here it's the a limited amount of time that I've been here there is a true culture within the Montpelier Police Department of helping as much as possible, not just the people we serve or each other, but it's, it's our fellow, it's, it's our peer law enforcement agencies. So there, there is a strong desire within the department itself to do everything that we can to get on board and, and to, uh, to, to look at regional models and to, to give the limited resources that we have, combine them with others and move forward for a stronger um, uh, way to service uh, our communities. Now, one thing that you posted on an extensive Facebook that went around that posting, and in that you mentioned um, different communities that the police will be dealing with, uh, including ethnic minorities, uh, but also those with mental health issues. 
Can you two elaborate on the relationship between mental health issues and 21st century policing and community policing? Uh, I can, I can, I'll give a quick 30,000 uh, foot view of overview that um, where we've come now, we can look at the history of it and there, there's a lot of sociology in there um, and, and economics in there. But where we're at now is to the point that law enforcement agencies become the default call for a lot of things that require social service function. So whether it's going to be um, shelter, whether it's gonna be crisis situations, whether it's gonna be, uh, you, you name it, uh, someone complaining that this person's not wearing a face mask, it's going to be law enforcement's the default call. That's just where we're at now. And um, police leaders for years now have been asking for to have dialogues to talk about what is appropriate and what's not appropriate for law enforcement agencies to, to respond to. But in the meantime, the argument could be there that we're slow at doing it. Um, it's a legitimate conversation to have. But law enforcement agencies have been working to try to, uh, to try to get past these challenges that we've had. So if you look at something like CIT or crisis intervention training, or what Montpelier did was took that, that concept and they localized it based on the needs and based on the resources that they have here, which is called Team 2. So it, it, we're still finding, we're, we're still, it's incumbent upon us to find ways to do these things, to answer these calls in safe manners, and we're working our hardest to do that. Tony, what is Team 2? Uh, team 2 is a state, it's the brainchild of, of uh, former Commissioner Murray Moulton, who's now the um, uh, <coughs> Executive Director of Washington County Mental Health. But when she was, um, was post-Irene, and they had to rebuild, essentially, the state's mental health system. Uh, we, you know, and so what Team 2, it was based off of a lot of the relationship that we had here in Washington County law enforcement, in particular, you know, like the Montpelier Police Department with Washington County Mental Health, where you know, if we went to a crisis call, hey, we need a screener here. This is, you know, and then... So it evolved from that relationship, which did not exist uh, capacity-wise throughout the state of Vermont. You have some outstanding programs like uh, uh, HCRS, uh, Howard, um, and some other places. But so what Team 2 is now, it's, it's a joint, it's an eight-hour block of instruction. Uh, there are some pre prerequisites to, to attend it. And, uh, but during that block of instruction, it, it's a scenario-based training where you, it starts off with understanding, you know, the laws around mental, mental health, but, and then it gets into the responsibility of law enforcement and or the mobile crisis worker. So we focus on the safety issues, the clinical issues, and legal issues. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, police should only be at the scene just to make sure it's safe, or at least get the situation to a point where it's safe and then introduce that person to the appropriate level of care and support that they need. And that is, you know, so that's really where the mental health crisis worker is going to be so valuable. Uh, the other benefit to Team 2, and it was very, it's, it, it's, I think the whole budget, and it's split between Department of Public Safety and Department of Mental Health right now, it's about $100,000. And um, so it's... Uh, it's 100000 statewide. Statewide. And, and but what it does is a lot of times is law enforcement and mental health can go out and, and assist somebody in crisis, stabilize the situation, and many times, um, you know, that person's going to stay in their home, you know, with the right, with the right support that they may need uh, the, on, from mental health side. Um, so it really, uh, so through that, again, through that training, you get to understand, okay, right now, person's, the person's got a gun, and this is where we're at. So it's going to be really law enforcement is going to it still needs to stabilize the safety factor, uh, but but also they can be helpful. They can also back up negotiators, police negotiators, but they're not going to be put in direct harm's way at that moment. Um, so these can ebb and flow the situation, and the other pieces. Um, so legally, do we have to put you know bring this get, eventually get this person you know do an, uh, an emergency uh, mental health warrant? which is getting them in front of a judge because they are such an immediate danger to themselves or others. Uh, or, um, you know what, this crime has been committed, but we'll deal with that secondarily. Right now, we just got to get the situation to a certain place where mental health can, can do their part. Chief Pete is inheriting three soft positions, in a sense. Uh, there's a social worker who will be in the car along Montpelier and Barry is sharing yes. one. There'll be a street 
person who will be working um, with homeless people or, or people sure. in crisis that one's, on the Yeah, that one's not, uh, we will support that position. Uh, that's not a Montpelier Police Department position. Only the, 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 the one that we're showing with Barry City, that one is. And then the third is the school resource yes. officer, which is half the school district and half the city. Uh, could you explain the evolution of the social worker and, and what that role is? Because that's something that's being discussed nationally, isn't it? The social worker or the SRO? Uh, the social, I'll get to okay. the SRO okay. in a second. The, is, isn't that being discussed nationally, the idea that there's well, certain it, it, things that social workers are better at than, absol than police? Abs absolutely, and a lot of people fall through the cracks. And, and so one of the things that we do know, you know, is, uh, as Brian said earlier, um, you know, so many calls for service have nothing to do with a crime uh, in, in today's society and can be, in many cases, can be best served by having somebody that's with the police because we're going to, they, they, they'll have access, they'll see our, you know, what calls we're responding to. And, and uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, ideally, they can have intervention before that person is in crisis. So in other words, sometimes just checking in on somebody and say, let's, let's say how, you know, let's, let's check on, on, you know, on Joe today. And just that human connection to community and knowing that somebody cares, uh, you know, yeah, they might be getting out of a cruiser with us, uh, but that may, for many people, that may be all the difference in the world from them spiraling into a crisis later that night where they might want to harm themselves. So now you're, you know, now you've got a, you know, a couple of police officers and an ambulance. Um, and it's really to, to uh, you know, more target how can we best help those that are kind of falling through the cracks? And, and if, you, if you look at it, you know, again, talking about the historics of it and the funding of it, but when you look at uh, access to health care, when you look at um, uh, governments being forced to the mantras, do more with less. So you're cutting funding at different places and you don't have, uh, you don't have proactive opportunities to find someone in crisis or who may be on their way towards crisis. And now it's just in a reactionary mode. So now when that person's in crisis and they're dealing with something with their families, now they're calling 911 for the police to come deal with the situation. So as, as social services kind of did this, uh, calls for 911 did that and now that's what so it's a best practice at looking at putting social workers in there because the only opportunities or options we have as law enforcement is do nothing or arrest somebody essentially that's it and you're gonna call a police officer to that situation and those are the only tools available or involuntary hospitalization you put them in the hospital as there might be a danger to somebody else or themselves or you ask them if they go voluntarily that's it and uh, so when you have an embedded social worker, you have the opportunity, to, the social worker, to reach out to community resources to try to work to make sure that this person, whoever's in crisis, has medication if they're taking their medication and if they're going to counseling sessions and they're getting different opportunities so that we're not coming back towards crisis situations. When we're in a crisis situation that's not mental health related but is marital volatility, is there an evolution on how we're dealing with domestic? <sighs> I think the evolution is, is in, in understanding um, law enforcement agencies partnering with uh, folks who do uh, domestic violence crisis on a daily basis, partnering with, uh, with those organizations and learning from them. So like for example, one of the newest things that we're talking about in the law enforcement uh, community is that you look at the eyes. You look to see if there's evidence of strangulation because we know now with strangulation can cause strokes, it can cause a lot of different problems. So the things that we're learning from our partners in domestic violence uh, that we apply towards the investigative avenue, but also in looking at how domestic violence tends to play out, the cycle of violence, and where law enforcement can come in and handle the situation um, with respect and understanding and empathy of what it is, you know. So um, the more that we know about all the calls that we're dealing with, the better we can respond and serve the people we're sworn to protect. Tony, given the pandemic and people stuck in the house together, given children in the house all the time, given financial uncertainty, are we seeing domestic uh, violence? You know, rising? in Montpelier, we haven't seen uh, uh, any noticeable spike. Um, however, that I know um, that the state's attorney, Roy Tebow, has seen, as, you know, has seen that spike in the county in terms of domestic violence cases. Uh, and then also, um, back in February, the FBI put out um, a, a basically a uh, informational bulletin 
that went out, we sent it out to uh, the school districts. But the other concern now is with all the kids at home, they're all online, is also making sure that, um, you know, helping both, both schools and families have resources to help deal with exploitation concerns, child exploitation uh, th because of the internet. Um, so those are some of the areas um, that uh, are er uh, certainly are of concern regarding both child exploitation and uh, as well as uh, domestic violence, you know, because of the, the new pressures and, and, and the challenges that COVID-19 has brought. Brian mentioned the school resource officer. Um, how long have we had a school resource officer? Half of it is paid for by the schools, half of it is paid for by the city. That position? Yes. Uh, initially, it started off as Chief White had a COPS grant, which is a community uh, or a policing uh, grant, it was a federal grant, uh, to, to cover the, f the, f the first the SRO that we had, which was uh, Mark Moody. And I, I, I'm thinking that was around 1996, somewhere around there. Uh, and that's what started the program. It, is, it, it has evolved considerably. And for the past five and a half years, uh, Matt Nisley was our, our school resource officer. and. And one of the things that we're very proud of um, with our unique relationship um, with, you know, with, with the schools and the community is that it really is a provides, you know, they're, they're one piece of a holistic approach to making sure that one, our schools are safe, but number two, when children are struggling, and there could be a variety of reasons. There could be, again, domestic violence in the home. There could be substance abuse, uh, poverty. Uh, you know, I will, I will say, uh, I know from my conversations with Mark, he, you know, he paid for ver uh, quite a few lunches in his day and things like that. And, uh, um, you know, just, just you, you never know what a child's going to be struggling with. So, um, and the other piece of that, and why I think the, 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 the link is so important to the, to the police department, uh, not everything happens in that child's environment, you know, while they're in school. So, uh, so when the officers go to a call for service and they see something, that's concerning, or you know, they have a big, bigger picture um, to help support that child um, or that family, whatever's needed. So it's very, very valuable in that regard. And when you think, I mean, prior to that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, there used to be a juvenile officer, uh, somebody because you know the laws are, are very specific around schools, uh, or children rather. Um, so this is a this is a new evolution of that. I mean, we're really against more of a holistic approach. They wear a different uniform. It's not even the same uniform. It's a little softer uh, uniform. And the other piece of that, unfortunately, is that we still have, have a, a national problem of sc significant school violence. Uh, you know, last year, uh, the, the you know, Montpelier school system adopted ALICE, which is an alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and escape. It, you know, just kind of a simple, you know, more complex version of a run, hide, fight uh, to make sure that our, our, we have a good system in place, both with our faculty, the students, age appropriate, of course, in that training, and, and also the fire department and, and police to make sure our schools are safe because, um, you know, with also in the physical security, I mean, things that Andrew LaRosa, the, you know, the, the, uh, the architect for, and the, uh, the facilities director for the school, we make sure that, you know, we have access controls and things like that. So it's just everything is making sure that um, when you drop your new kid off at school, that it's, you know, you want to be the safest place that they're going to be for that day. Chief P. Well, I think um, there's a national dialogue right now to uh, pretty much tear up anything that's related to a police department. Um, and I think that's, uh, I understand the emotion behind the, the conversation, but I think that's unfortunate. Um, uh, things that we've done as a profession, unitedly as a profession, um, and, um, but we have to remember the good of the situation. And, um, so I look at an SRO as, uh, as the opportunity for, you can't, we're all dealing with limited resources. You can't catch everything all the time. So my question to folks um, that are considering something like pulling an SRO would be, how many layers of safety do you want for your children? And uh, teachers aren't gonna catch everything. School counselors aren't gonna catch everything. Um, it's unfortunate because there's a lot going on. But you have one more insular layer of somebody who cares and somebody who wants to be there and somebody who wants to, 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 um, to help children, to help our kids. And I think um, as long as we understand and we have clearly defined roles and actions of what it is that we're supposed to be doing within law enforcement, within a school counselor, within the teachers, within the administration itself, you, have a, you could have a very robust system. And in here in Montpelier, 
systems working. And uh, so I think we just need to make sure that we, we stay cognizant of it and we stay on top of what it is our training needs to be and what it is that we, um, as a collective team, as all stakeholders who care about the safety of our children, um, are, are uh, needing to do to move forward. Both police chiefs. This is Vermont. Low level adult drug use, marijuana use. Is that prioritized at all in this town? Uh, you can grow a few plants and use them yeah. yourself. Do we? Does our police spend a lot of time on? on we marijuana? do not. Um, if I can just real quick, our, our biggest challenge with that is just we you know we still lack you know an effective way for roads. You know if you're operating a vehicle. If you're not operating, yeah. if you're just not operating a vehicle, own. it's. Not a priority yeah. at all. Chief Pete? I'd just say that our resources are limited, and uh, I, I think that we're more interested in focusing on um, the people who bring the poison into the community um, rather than chasing after the people who may have addiction issues and need help with something. I have one more question before you retire after tomorrow. What challenges does Chief Pete have? What, what's up the road for him that you would uh -huh. say is, is his challenge? His principal challenge. His principal challenge is, is going to be, um, you know, taking a step back and once we kind of see where, um, you know, Montpelier wants to go financially and priori priority-wise, uh, where the legislature is going and where Congress is going with a lot of police reform and, and how um, it's a very strong department and we have strong community support, uh, but it's going to be navigating what is the outcome of those. Please. Police Chief Pete, I want to ask one, what can my wife and I and the rest of Montpelier do for you? Um, you've done everything. People of this community have already done it. It's um, my wife, Natalie, my daughter, Gabriella. We feel so welcome here. And um, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a, a facade. It's actual real. There's a sincerity here that just that brings a sense of peace. Um, and we're, we're just enjoying our time here. And the only thing we could ask for is uh, me personally, professionally, uh, would be just um, let me know when I'm doing wrong, let me know when I'm doing right so I can continue to, uh, to uh, serve because I take that oath extraordinarily seriously. Before I end, I just want to say on behalf of all of you who are watching this, thank you very much for years of service in Montpelier, Tony. Thank you. It's appreciated by everyone who's watching this. And I appreciate you yes. watching this and I hope that you'll watch the other shows because they're really good as I go through my plugs. And um, thank you so very much. Have a good evening.